So maybe we should do a math version of this. Can we mathematize it? <laughs> and then just get rid of the math. I've been working on building out some models to make this nice and confusing. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Sunday the 24th of February 2019, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. Revolutionary Strategy, Marxism and the Challenge of Left Unity was a book written by Mike McNair in 2008, in which he analysed the history of the 20th century from a Marxist perspective to see what strategic learnings could be gleaned. In this reading group, we hope to tease out what they are and what we think of them. This week, I have the new patrons to thank Mike Schwab, James Knight, Alb1137 and Brent Beaumont. You too can become a patron for as little as $5 a month, which works out at about $1 an episode. Patrons can vote on and take part in the reading group series, and when we reach 50 patrons, I will record an extra Patreon-only podcast every month, fortnightly if you reach 100. To those with extra cash lying about who donate at the higher tiers, get extra benefits like a personally handcrafted commie badge, choice of topic slash guest, and even a one-on-one call with yours truly. So if you'd like some of that, you too can become part of the gang gang by clicking on that there Patreon button. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel. I try to respond to each and every one of them. Also, make sure to like, subscribe and share. You can also join me on Facebook or Twitter too. Okay, let the reading group commence. Hello and welcome to the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. We have got a very full house here today. Okay, let's let's start introducing people. Who do we have here? Let's start with the new people. We've got Sophia. Sophia, do you want to say hi? Hi, Sophia here. Who's next? Who do we have? We then call up to, I think, the East Coast. Rosa, are you there? Yeah, I am not on the East Coast at all, but yeah, Midwest God. gal. Next is... Lexi, how are you? Hey, I'm doing all right. Now, I am on the East Coast. You can tell because of my f- affected demeanor. The closer you are to the Europe, the more intelligent you sign. That's what I say. Derek, where are you lingering on the West Coast? West Coast? Um, I'm, I'm lingering <laughs> in the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> Man, your understanding of American geography is really poor. The Rockies are in the West. <laughs> yeah, but they're not coastal. There's another, like, nine hours of driving. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's America. Shit, come on, America's massive. Okay, so today we're going to try and get through the introduction of this book and maybe see how we get along in the first chapter. I was wondering if we just maybe let people talk a little bit earlier about maybe about their impressions so far of the book and what they want to get out of this. So let's go back to Rosa. It it just lays out like a relatively realistic strategy in terms of like building up a party it's more fulfilling to have like that long term like building up of a party rather than like waiting for like some spontaneous mass of like workers to rise out of nothing or just have like you know five person party with their dog holding up the true proletarian line it's just like i I don't feel like either of those are particularly productive on the left and it's also an alternative to just straightforward hardline activism that just gets ends up in just sort of like being sucked into like NGO work for the Democratic Party or whatever the equivalent of the Democratic Party would be in European nations. Although I, I don't know, they're more like actual straightforward labor parties, whereas we have like a weird populist party instead of like a labor party. It presents like a real relatively realistic outline for revolutionary strategy. I don't want to fucking repeat the title. (laughs) It presents like a realistic idea of the party as like a multi-tendency sort of organization. And actually multi-tendency organization, not like whenever like groups talk about like being a multi-tendency organization and they don't actually have any more tendencies than one that just dominates it. Like you're allowed to have factions and like a mass party, that sort of thing. And, you know, that seemed relatively interesting 
to me coming out of like a space where you know it was like sort of dogmatic like the totalitarian elements of the party would be the big thing with the party okay uh, well like derek do you want to give a a shout about what you think about the book or i i am a friendly skeptic to this book this shock this also shocked me out of a sort of like communization theory path that i was going down for a long time when i got very frustrated coming out of a uh, trotskyism this book got me thinking about the seeming difference between party organization and its relationship to but not dominance of the class or classes that it claims to be representing and so it's interesting because if you're a if you're a vanguard theorist you can believe in this book but if you're not you can also still pretty much believe in this book what the party looks like when they merge is different but i find that fascinating so that was a good wake up call to me my concerns are, and I'm going to state them just right out the gate, is there seems to be a concern with the left and not the workers movement, where a lot of us who have thought about this a lot, because I've been, I was in a party that was inspired by this book for a little while, with, with Lexi, actually. Vouch. I think I was also technically in that party, although I was like the one member branch of Chicago. Yeah, and I, I, I was, I was at large. <laughs> Oh, um, I wasn't even in the country. Um, <laughs> so the funny thing about this to me is that I both kind of believe in this book and want to argue with it. The reason why I want to argue with it is that as much as this intuitively makes sense to me, I've never seen anyone actually do it since the first international. <laughs> I mean, the Bolsheviks arguably did, but their 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 situation's a little different. So when we go through this, I'm kind of going through it with the, I want to be convinced by this. I kind of innately sort of agree with most of it, but part of me is just like, but why doesn't anyone ever do this? Cause it should be obvious. And why can't the people inspired by this book do this? I think I had like a relatively same issue with it. Like a few days back when I actually tried to email the weekly worker about like publishing an article that I wrote on like American strategy for building up like a mass party in the United States. The editor did not receive it very well. It gave me like a two, two or three cent response that essentially amounted to this is unrealistic. I, I didn't really mind that. I really didn't mind like, oh, man, this is not how we want to do it. This is not how you're not actually trying to build the mass party first and foremost. And but like the last sentence that like stuck out for me was we're trying to recruit from the advanced elements of the working class that are in sacks and it's like rival sacks. And it's like, what? <laughs> and I was just like, I just sent like an email back. Like I had sort of like a mildly snotty response to that. Like, yeah, I'm not even, I'm not really sure if there are many workers in our sacks in the United <laughs> States, let alone advanced workers. I mean, I guess you could argue proles, but that's a more broader category than workers, maybe. But at the same time, you know. That's weird. Yeah, there's something that's in the text a lot yes. that it's given out about is the sect sectism. But look, we had this yeah. this problem we had as well with our climbing series when we have the weird dichotomy between the politics and the actual the work. So I think we'll probably run into some of this. I, I yeah. undoubtedly because I think a lot of if we're proper materialists, I think a lot of these people like McNair are coming out of a culture of truck groups and fighting with Jerry Healy and the AWL and all these groups that nobody outside of about a thousand people in England know who they are. So it it's weird how it doesn't oh, seem to apply. They know about Healy through like tabloids. They they know about Healy. They know about yeah. Healy and his organization solely through tabloids because it was like it was an incredibly yeah. abusive, like, sex cult, basically. That's why some people know about him. I'd say if you walk down the street in, in London and you asked a thousand people, maybe five people would know who Jerry Healy is, to put it yeah. into the perspective, you know? But, um, so, anyway, Derek, what were we talking about? Oh, your skepticism is you like the book, but you're kind of, you're kind of wondering how come it hasn't been used yet, and that makes you skeptical. Is that your general Yeah, issue? That, that's my general. I mean, th since this book has been presented to me, I've been always like, well, 
Why doesn't anyone ever do it? And I think my other my other innate criticism is I don't know how you get to the merger formula when there is it's not dead, but when the workers' movement's so nebulous and inchoate in in a lot of places, and so it's like trying to like merge with something that is not self aware or self consistent, particularly in America. But I mean, I don't think it's just America. Decline in the labor movement is basically worldwide. I guess my answer to that is that, like, I think in a process of doing base building in a socialist org, like as a whether it's like a pre party formation or an actual party, in, o- in order to do that base building, you do want to kind of participate in the labor movement and help build that up as much as possible, or at least support it. And so in my mind, that kind of creates like this, this feedback loop to where as you try to build your base for your socialist org, you're also helping out the labor movement, and helping that get back on its feet. But you know, maybe, maybe that's a bunch of bullshit. I don't know. The fear I have is, is that you try to create a labor movement that automatically looks like your party from the ground up and so you never get to where you can have multiple tendencies or multiple representations and really hash out the problems of the class because you're trying to set down prerequisites before you even before the thing even exists like it's this almost platonic model of a program and again that isn't addressed in this book this book doesn't i mean this book does address programism and stuff but not not to the same degree and I, i'm just interested in this book because i both like and, and and am suspicious of the fact so many different groups like malice who are attracted to hal draper like this book trotskyists who are attracted to hal draper like this book um people who come out of the organization that i come back from really long ago um platypus were often attracted to this book but those people fundamentally disagree on like almost everything right. and what i liked about this book is what i initially was attracted to bordiga for as uh rosa brought up bordiga in the early days had this like you don't kill factions in the party because the party is the brain of the proletariat so all factions and any group that is can be fairly represented within the party you know needs to be allowed to flourish so you can have this discussion that then can go out into the world you know, in reality, Bordigo like gives by the time he gets to the invariant program, which is pretty early, he he throws that out. For me, when I read this, I see that, but I also just think like, are we at such an early stage that we're not even at this point yet? And the base building stuff is interesting, and like it's we will have to talk about this a little bit. But there, the, the elephant in the room with base building is you eventually need money to keep it going. Like when I when I was in Red Party, and again the party was inspired by this book explicitly. We had debates, and I wrote articles on that element of the strategy, and I started talking about how only really religious parties have been able to do it successfully, and that is because they had you know bourgeois bankrollers, and not just one or two like the Bolsheviks had, but like tons. And even then, there seems to be like a natural capstone that you hit, unless it's a war zone. So. We all have to we all have to deal with that. But I the, the thing is I don't know that like again, the strategy part of this is much larger than that. So I don't want to limit it to that discussion. Yeah. Although yeah, these are just opening remarks, right? Uh, I just was gonna say like as a quick response, I think part of it is that like I do think the labor movement is is in a mild, I don't know, renaissance or something like that. Like I think with at least in the US with like the teacher strikes and things like that, it's starting to wake up. And I think as capitalism continues to take take its course, we're going to continue to see that. And I think that that labor movement will dissipate without some kind of socialist party or socialist organization to support it. And so I think, I don't think that base building will entirely subsume the rebuilding of the labor movement. You know, I do think any kind of socialist organization that's serious needs to be a dues paying org. I've been part of organizations that do that. And while it can be messy at times, I, so it's been relatively successful, you know, keeping a war chest, making sure that there's funds available to bail people out and all that kind of shit. I think we should like take into account that there's a difference between like worker and proletariat throughout the history of like Marxism, the terms have been used pretty much interchangeably worker proletariat that sort of thing it's workers of the world unite you know 
but like I feel like the proletariat is actually a broader category, even though like one could sort of like base it in like the worker as being like the most basic proletarian. McNear right. makes the point ex explicitly, doesn't he, that it's everybody who's dependent yes. on the wage fund as opposed to just the workers in the factory. Yeah, uh, and this it comes down to the problem of like working identity versus the structural position of the work working class, you might say. Yeah, so if we think about it in those terms rather than simply the workers' movement, you, you still see resistance on the part of the proletariat. It's just more scattered and more frantic i guess like we see it mm -hmm. with like the yellow vest protests in france rioting uh, against police brutality stuff like that it's these sort of like spontaneous sort of moments of resistance that just sort of like fade in and out because like usually what happens is like the moment happens and then immediately like ngo mm -hmm. types try to get in on it like the people who are involved it don't generally trust like the ngo people right and thus it moves on to a college campus almost always it's good to that you brought up the sort of like i don't know movement of squares like autonomous anti-politics like whatever you you know those little tantrums that we get every few years that you know was pretty much the exhaustive like revolutionary horizon <laughs> for for the whole time we've been alive so when occupy fizzled out I, when I started Occupy, I was something of an unconscious counselist. As I finished Occupy, I was so frustrated that I, you know, thought Leninism looked okay. But the whole time that I was going through these things, I was looking for something that was not reformism, not Leninism, and not anarchism. I was impressed by early council communism, like I was saying. But, you know, something didn't add up. And um, when I ran into communization, you, you, you just sort of have to admit the reason that communization uses the sort of nihilism to, to kind of give you like negative feelings and it like, like it uses the toxic memes that it does is to psych yourself out of false hopes that are kind of obviously false. Marxists sometimes take refuge in history to think of times that were actually quite horrible, but because they were more tractable and there was more of a, of an obvious struggle, there's something more satisfying you know, when we're reading about these times than the times that we actually live in, which is a lot more desperate and a lot more disseparate in terms of what resistance actually means. Could you explain communization for people who don't know what it is? Yes. To pick up on the tendencies that Rosa was talking about with the, the left communist tendencies that think that the party should abstain from elections, and then the sort of broadly ultra left tendencies that think that communists shouldn't even really fuck with a party because parties are just for domination. There's a beyond the ultra left quote unquote position where essentially you still take on Marx's analysis of capital and to some extent of history, but you essentially capitulate to Bakunin and say, well, Marx was just straight up wrong. This whole like creating a some kind of bridge towards communism, that's not going to work. Anytime you do that, it's going to end up in a dictatorship over the proletariat. You kind of just need to skip to communism. That's what communization, broadly speaking, is about. And I was not willing to accept this. It sounded in some ways even dumber than Trotskyism or something, which I was around. On the other hand, it had by far the best scholarship of any of the politically relevant tendencies that I saw around the feeding frenzy when Occupy died. It engaged with the analytical Marxists in particular, and that tickled me because I was always looking for revolutionary analytical Marxism. The thing that you really have to hate about the analytical Marxists, no matter what, is that it also kind of slides into revisionism. So I, I was convinced that this these analyses could be paired with better politics. And in a way, the communizers Instead of doing LaSalle, like analytical Marxist with LaSalle, they're doing analytical Marxist with Bakunin. It, was, it wasn't quite what I was looking for, but it at least maintained some kind of revolutionary horizon. So around the same time that I was getting into that stuff, I, I ended up, actually just after I had done a, a reading series on left communism with one of the EndNotes people, I ran into this book. It was the only book I thought that had basically anything, first of all, to offer that wasn't reformism wasn't obviously explicitly Leninism, we'll get to that later, and, and was also not anarchism. 
And then it also had, I thought it was, I thought it had something to say about the way that we need to deal with these nadirs in the workers movement. And, you know, even if there's a possibility that we don't get like a labor movement, like the old one in the future, that we're not going to be focused on the point of production as the locus for organization. We, we have to think more broadly about these things. McNair, I think, has stuff that deals with that more so than any other like Marxist in that regard, Marxist politically speaking. Now, the thing you'll notice about this book that I think is most pro politically relevant now is its subtitle, <laughs> The Challenge of Left Unity. I want to bring this up because in the actual history of McNair's party, the CPGB, not the weird ML one, they attempted a left unity effort that they chronicled in excruciating depth in their paper, The Weekly Worker, which is probably the best like Marxist party rag you can find, but it's also this sect minutia, unreal. Step by step, you can see it, that degenerate breakdown probably would be good for a study on small group sociology. We also sort of have the fortune now of having our own sort of left unity effort with Marxist Center of all the people that, you know, want to be left of the DSA that are coming together. I think that's interesting. The only thing is that in the UK, once left unity broke down, there was a, another group within the CPGB called the Labour Party Marxists. The Labour Party Marxists were sort of similar to the inside outside DSA people. But as Rosa said, entryism into the Labour Party, which, you know, however bourgeois it is, is still in some bizarre way a you know trade union party versus the, like the democratic party there's something about labor party marxism that broadly makes sense from this book's perspective so once left unity goes down as an option the cpgb turns towards labor party marxism and they end up smelling like roses for a little bit now because corbin not only became the big kahuna in the labor party but also didn't get elected, so remained in opposition, <laughs> which is very yeah. important. And so the way that this, I think, intervenes with the Marxist center that we've been talking about is, first of all, when they're talking about Marxist center, they're using it in Hal Draper's sense and not as much in McNair's sense. But more importantly... To be that, fair, they flip back and forth. Uh, they flip back I mean, and forth, and but they, they also have abstentionist people in there. And so that's... And their whole strategy is actually around base building. They think it's kind of premature to look at program and party. And so it's we, we could look at McNair as a competing left unity tendency to base building. McNair actually thinks the important thing to do would be to programmatically consolidate party. Yeah, I think with the breakdown of left unity, they made a shift from left unity to Marxist unity, unity among Marxists. I think they explicitly leave out MLs also in like Marxist unity for. So, so by MLs, do. we mean Stalinist. Yeah, quote Marxist lunches. I'm <laughs> trying to use the polite term for them. I guess, broadly speaking, I, I started off as a, what might be called an anarcho liberal. And then I was sort of a mutualist for a second. And then as I started to organize, it became more of like a traditional, like, you know, anarcho communist or whatever. And then towards the end of my anarchist days, I was some hybrid between anarchist and council communists. I, you know, I didn't care what it was. I was just skeptical of authoritarianism. And it really wasn't this book that broke me from those tendencies. It was actually State and Revolution by Lenin that broke me from that. Because my whole life up until that point as an anarchist, my adult life as an anarchist, I was taught that Lenin is evil, Kronstadt and all the bad things that happened under him, you know, was his fault. And there's kind of this like moralizing about Lenin. Then I read State and Revolution and it sounded pretty liberatory and, and cool. You know, any cook can govern. We need to abolish standing armies and police and just have the self armament of the workers and a very strong emphasis on democracy. I mean, really, Lenin's what Lenin was hoping to accomplish, one of the things he was hoping to accomplish with State and Revolution was to win over anarchists, and it worked on me. And it was around the same time I actually started listening to Swampside, and that's how I found out about this book. 
I actually haven't finished it yet. This is really my first time through. I've read the chapters that we read today, I've read before, but this is all kind of new to me, which is odd because I've been calling myself, for, you know, an orthodox Marxist or whatever you want to call it for a little while now. But I haven't read this book, which is kind of held up as like one of the primary texts of that tendency. So I don't know what to make of that. But I guess what I'm hoping to get out of this is just understanding the sect I guess I belong to, if that makes any sense. You know, this is one of the, the main texts, so I feel I should read it. And what better way to do it than publicly? Very good. Well, I came across this book via Lexi, I think. And I remember like a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, I think maybe one of the first times I had Derek on the podcast, I asked him, was there anybody who had done like any kind of historical analysis of revolutions and strategies and stuff like that? And I remember Derek, he didn't put me onto this book, but he did talk about the analytical Marxists a bit. I never mentioned it again. And then until Lexi put me onto it and I read it and I've just, when I read this book, it's like, it's like the book I, not the same that I could have written it, but it's like the book I had in my head that I wanted somebody to have done. To me, it's a very, very interesting book because he looks historically, you know, he makes the point in the book that we should be using our history for scientific understanding and looking what works and what doesn't work and what was a disaster and what was good and what's not. And he goes through all these different strategic and tactical elements and defines and talks about them and looks at the history. And for me, it was just, and I've mentioned to people before, I've, I've been a professional poker player in the past. And it just reminded me like a kind of like a game theory for a revolutionary Marxism. You know, it was so fresh when I read it. I was like, Christ, you know, I've never come across something like this. To me, it's always so easy to pick holes in stuff you might read. Somebody reads and writes an article on this and you go, well, well, what about that? And this and oh, well, what about that? But like very rarely do you do I read a whole in-depth argument and go, shit, man, mm -hmm. like this is extremely well thought through. And it seems to me to to be correct. And that's what I like about it. It's like what I liked about the TSSI. And I, this is, is similar for me. Now, I'm not a historical person. I'm like, I don't know the history like you guys know. I don't know the history of Russia. I haven't read Lenin. I'm not one of those people who knows all that stuff. So I'm coming at this from a position of a lack of knowledge. So I'm probably going to say pejorative things for people who are listening to it. They'll think, oh, God, I hate this guy or God, he's watched too many Chomsky videos or something. And I'm fully aware of that. So, <laughs> you know, and that's where I come from. So I, I, I'm just looking forward to reading and hearing the counter arguments and everything. But I think this is a, a, a kind of a classic, but it's not well known. And hopefully maybe what we're doing might bring it to the masses. I, I think we have an interesting spectrum of how we feel about this. And we're going to have to try not to get bogged down in our different micro nuances because they're they're definitely there. Lexi, you mentioned why yeah. well, you were attracted to this. and we got turned on to it roughly at the same time. One of the things that's interesting um, is I, I've been reading the analytical Marxist since I was taught by an evil conservative Hegelian. I'm not going to name him because we called him. He was actually a sweet man, but he's a, he's a, he is a reactionary. Hey, evil has great resources. <laughs> yeah. I started reading McNair when I left Platypus Affiliated Society in 2012, 2013, somewhere there after Occupy. And I hadn't read this book at the time, but I had read his articles, which had been very appealing to me. And it took me a long time to realize he wasn't a left communist, actually, because he had the same kind of snark I did. He's very sassy. But one of the things that I want to get into, Lexi, is that you brought up the, 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 this, the issue here is left unity. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be sort of our background discussion you know, I think one of the questions going to run through this with, with both the merger formula elements of it and the left unity elements of it is... Is left unity really that great of an idea? And if it's not, is this book still in the main right? And he doesn't say, for example, Marxism and how awesome left unity is. <laughs> like the awesome unicorn communism of left unity, it, it is posed as a challenge, a challenge which, yeah. you know, you, you have to democratically deal with. I think I'm going to be bringing it up all the time. <laughs> and and, I'm, and I swear, I'm not going to go into these minor sectarian squabbles. I promise. I swear. Tom's got his gun out. I mean, he's in England, so he doesn't have a gun. But, you know, like, 
Whatever. I um, have my I have my Semtex. I've got Semtex. Oh my god. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all right donald Mark. can you can you hear us yes i can hear y'all all right so um i was introduced into the left by occupy the organized left i had been radicalized by the anti-war movement when i was younger but never really like got involved in the activism and through that that kind of wave of activism that happened around that period i came into contact with a really fucked up marxist leninist sect that was organizing at my university uh, frizzo they tried to recruit me and it was a horrifying experience and so i was really like basically i became like a really big ultra left left communist after that i um kind of went in a more bordigas direction and i i don't know i kind of just saw how it was kind of this kind of left communist like dogmatism was was like a dead end and i started reading more mcnair and weekly worker stuff and just reading like lenin and trotsky and bukharin and zetkin and just like the classic like communist and also reading about the history behind you know the german revolution and the russian revolution so mcnair's arguments and it just started making more sense to me and so i kind of saw myself coming more towards like a like a Marxist centrist, like Orthodox Leninist position, like kind of like I guess like a Kotsky, like kind of like a Kotsky in Leninism is what I would see McNair as like representing. That's how I'm here. And we also have Ian. Can you hear us, Ian? Yes, I can hear you quite well. Basically, just follow exactly what Donald said because we've known each other online for probably about five years now. Starting out through uh, left communism, yeah, because we didn't really like the background of it's. It's strange. It's almost like we didn't want to be Trotskyists, but worked ourselves back to an essentially post-Trotskyist position, which is what <laughs> the neo-Kautskyian position is in essence. Because you don't really, you don't really have the uh, neo-Kautskyist position without the sort of trots spending the entirety of the 20th century preserving the sacred texts and rediscovering a lot of this stuff. Donald got me to read this a second time, because the first time I read it, I was not as impressed as the second time I read it, to be frank. Well, I also and, read this in a um, like a live reading group scenario with um, other fellow communist militants back in the day when I lived in Tampa. And that was a very like you know educational and exciting experience because we had all kind of read all the left communist and classic Marxist stuff. And this kind of it, it showed a way forward where you could kind of take this really principled internationalist Marxist stance, but actually make it work in reality somehow and actually make these principles like act out in the real world. Will we start talking about the introduction? The introduction it kind of lays out the entire book. You know, yeah, like, I think we should skip most of the introduction except for this one question. Should socialists join our support government coalitions, including people like Brown, in order to keep out of the open rightists? Should we be fighting for unity of the Marxist left on the basis of open defense of Marxist politics or for a new mass workers' party or for a party not programmatically delimited between reform and revolution? Or is it wrong to seek to create a party at all? If we should be fighting for a Marxist party, does it mean it should be Trotskyist or Maoist or Stalinist or something else? And sh should we call for the workers' government? And if so, what would we mean by it? Should we be defeatist in relationship to our own country's wars? If so, what does this mean? These are the present political questions affecting socialists. Period. Done. <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, like, I think that that does frame what this book is trying to answer pretty succinctly and yeah i think the rest the rest of the introduction is like almost the cliff notes version of the entire book so we can just go to chapter one from there well can we break down just a little bit what he what, what those questions are because there's a lot of questions in there so the first one he says should the socialists join government coalitions like the labor party he's talking here in the in the book it's basically primarily uk politics but um, this goes all the way back to um. I guess I'm gonna be the the history nerd here, but like this goes all the way back to like the classic debate between the German Social Democratic Party and the French Social Democratic Party yeah. under Kowski and Babel's later leadership. The SPD was against entering coalitions and gaining ministerial positions in the executive of the government. Like they ran obviously for the legislative, they had a you know electoral strategy, but their 
strategy was not to enter government. Whereas in France, you had um, the socialists under Jean Jars and that whole tendency believed in entering government through coalitions with like the progressive bourgeois Jacobin Republican types. So in like around like 1902, you saw French social democrats enter the French government actually as ministers. And that was really controversial in Kautsky and, you know, the German socialists. Like they saw that as like as revisionism. I mean, I think for that okay. first question, should socialists join or support government coalitions, including people like Brown and you know, to keep out the open rightists? I think I would say no. And it se- that seems like a kind of an easy question that although all of us come from very like broad and different backgrounds, I think I don't know a lot of you very well, but my hunch is that most of us can agree on that. I don't, am I incorrect with that or? Probably unanimously agree, right? Well, it might be worth actually going back to like what his questions are predicated on, though, and the idea of the independence of the Workers' Party itself. I don't really think you can ask these questions about exclusion and what the party itself should do without asking that. One of the important things here is like McNair's talking about, we need to win over, we need a principled unity of Marxists. When he asks the question, do we want a unity of Marxists? Do we just want a general labor party? McNair is arguing we want a, a party that's a unity of the best Marxist in general around the political program, not around the specific ideology. I think when McNair is talking about this, he is talking about parties and unity of parties. So I think right. he's talking about, you know, bringing in a Stalinist sect. From my point of view, these Stalinist sects, while they may exist on the internet and there may be like 11 of them in some sect in London, they're not in any way a force in politics. It's a practical question, not the, individ- the individual you can. You can change someone's mind. That's totally true. So to pivot a little bit away from that, to take some of those things into account, but to go into the next question, these questions actually, the wording specifically come out of British politics. The new mass workers movement, uh, workers party, the party not programmatically delimited between the foreign revolution. Those are actually, I think, almost specifically Trotskyist, uh, different forms Mm -hmm. of Trotskyist formulations. To go a little bit deeper into what what's in the background of my head on this is I keep on wanting to apply this to American context. And and when we talk about this emails mm-hmm. and all this stuff, I agree they don't matter anymore. But in the 60s and 70s, there was probably half a million of them. I mean, if you read Max Elbon's book, Revolution in the Air, they, like that was the predominant movement of American communism after the after Students for a Democratic Society fell apart part of that's because the panthers part of that's because the rcp part of that's, there's a lot of reasons for it and i, I don't want to get into the hyper sectarian analysis here because good lord that could take forever but the question th- that actually does move us to the next question if if we are fighting for a party and if we mean a revolutionary party in some sense should it be trotskyist maoist or marxist leninist or stalinist or something else I mean, I think the answer that we come to immediately as a preposition is no for all of them are we would be Trotskyist, Maoist, or MLs. And some of us have been some of those things. Like uh, the, the, a lot of the hostility people have towards towards Marxist Leninists, I don't have the same background with them. I, I like I've never I've dealt with them, but not in the same way. Um, but I have some hostility to Trotskyist, even though I love Trotsky. So like I try to, I have to ask myself that question outside of my prior experience. It seems like McNair, that, that question is rhetorical because if any of those worked, they would have already worked. <laughs> like, it's not like we haven't had a history of like a thousand Trotskyists blooming, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> to kind of respond to all this, the worrying, concerning thing that one sees as a Marxist, is that the petty, sadistic, bureaucratic tyranny or micro-tyranny of Stalinism, it, it makes sense when it's coming from people upholding a cult of personality in a brutal class society. It doesn't make sense when it's coming from <laughs> supposed dissidents to that tradition. So for instance, again, Trots, Trotskyists can do this, anarchists can do this, autonomous Marxists and, you know, Marxist humanists can replicate all the same sort of awful dynamics. It seems like there's some kind of structural problem with 20th century socialist politics, the revolutionary heritage that we've 
kind of, we have inherited. We keep repeating this, even if we're very ideologically opposed to it. There's a structural well, one, issue at work. One thing I just say is that if you went into any like bourgeois party, the Labour Party, the Tory Party, the Democrats, I think you'll find all of those same types of behaviours in those two. Well, th that's true, but that's why those things will never be vehicles of liberation, ever. That's exactly why. Even though we have to deal with political reality, we can't just completely absorb ourselves into bourgeois political norms. We have to do something else somehow. Like, that's the whole point. Like, this is, this is what a revolution would mean. We have to attack the state. We can't just, like, go in and start, you know, sucking out surplus. It has to, we have to do something different. And I, I guess I want to also work from Derek's point about putting this into the American context. I've corresponded a little bit with McNair by email, and he readily admits, I have no idea what's going on, you know, over there in America. That's just, you know, that's not, it's not what I do. When I read the first thing, you know, the, the rough American translation is, you know, should socialists vote for Hillary to keep Trump out is basically what that even amounts to in our context. And it's not, it's, that doesn't actually work totally because what Brown is what, like a uh, neoliberal or something like this. Hillary is, I suppose, a neoliberal, but, but not from a labor party. So to make this rhyme, we have to treat the labor party like the Democrats, which is a bit rough. I guess we could also try to substitute, you know, the DSA for this. But I want to like actually downplay the role of ideology here. I think structurally, when you look at the inside outside strategy of, you know, the Labour Party Marxists and the Labour Party in the UK and the inside outside strategy of the Democratic Socialists of America in the Democratic Party in the US, that the structural characteristics and the structural resemblance is of more importance than the fact that the Democrats is a populist party and doesn't have doesn't have that labor like heritage built in. One thing about the introduction, he's kind of going to set us up for this idea of the, the kind of opposing strategies of MLs or the truck groups versus this idea of the social democrats. I think that's actually pretty correct. What's funny about that to me is that there are other factors that you have to kind of deal with. It's not like both MLs and trots don't have like coalitionary theories. Like in Trotskyism, there's united frontism. And with MLs, there's popular frontism. And those things are, they seem not that different at first, but they're actually very, very different. Describe what those two are and the differences. So united frontism is the idea that you can work with in a limited sense with bourgeois parties, but never endorse them. Don't give, you know, you don't give them money. You just, you have a tactical aim and that's it. And popular frontism is you can subsume yourself into these groups as a faction within them. And sometimes even hide the fact you're a faction within them. Like the RCP did with the uh, students for a democratic society in America or like even like, you know, Mao's relationship to the Kuomintang in China so the difference is how explicitly you make your differences known and how much you're willing to like be in an actual overlapping disciplinary framework with those groups. Well, can I add that like also like it would it would imply you would be in a government coalition with these people. Right. right. Both of them imply a government coalition, right? United Front is not necessarily a government coalition. And it can right. be just like you said, just a tactical alliance for a specific struggle. Whereas, like you said, the popular front is different. Yeah, so like Shiraza is a popular front, technically, for example. <laughs> well, the last question we haven't talked about is, should, should we call for workers' government and what would we mean by it? And of course, I guess that is yes, but that second clause is huge. <laughs> well, uh, uh, McNair actually takes the rhetorical tack of, well, the workers' government slogan is a bad one. And it, which is a very vague way of saying something like a dictatorship of the proletariat has to actually be a universal state. Yeah, the um, workers government question is basically related to a very specific strategic moment of the KPD in 1923 when they were trying to basically come to power but have a coalition of the SPD be a kind of halfway house between the dictatorship of the proletariat 
But the last actual last question was, so should we be defeatist in relation to our own country's wars? And what does this mean? Which is kind of, you know, that's one of my favorite questions, personally. I think when it comes to uh, being defeatist, later on, Nick Nair talks about how, like, he thinks the answer is yes. But people who take up this slogan or this position often don't realize, like, Lenin was talking about something very specific in a very specific time in a specific war. But generally speaking, I think we should be defeatist in in our country's imperialist wars. Now, what exactly that does that mean is tricky. Like, do we think that the United States should just pull out all of a sudden from all the countries that's occupying the Middle East? Yes. yes. I mean, I, I would I would also tend to agree with that. But yes. what what happens then in those countries is my my question. You know what I mean? Well, I suppose I think also he, he could you could make the argument about like should you support a bourgeois imperialist war against say a Nazis against Nazis think, yes against ISIS that would be that's a very tricky situation you ISIS know, is think, very different yeah I would say if you were an American we should have been for the defeat of American imperialism in all circumstances I think that like revolutionary defensism is really only like a applicable when you're like fighting a genocide like the ussr was against the nazis or like in anti-colonial struggles i i think so too but i i still think that in a case where you've got something like isis where they are to me as bad as nazis and they are genociding people defeatism there that's a more difficult case to make for me you know what do you think the syrians should be doing that fighting Honestly, like I think Assad and Russia have done a fine enough of a job beating ISIS with you know in the YPG and stuff, and I think like it's just you know it's, it's, we should question the idea that our country has a right to be a, a police in the other parts of the world. Like it's all about undermining like nationalism as much as possible too. Like we want to basically like make people you know become anti-nationalist, and so part of this is undermining you know, support for our own government's wars and, and supporting the idea that war isn't in our interest. Okay, I, I didn't mean to actually make make it about specifically ISIS, but I just kind of wanted to make it more about, tease out that question. You know, I wasn't actually making a case for America staying, <laughs> just let me straight, I think they should right. But I was just trying to make that generic point that some wars, I think in, in the context of this question, it should be said as well, is that McNair is talking about these overtly imperial wars and he also makes the case in it later for defensist policy too, whereby well, he makes a, Euro, a case a country, for Soviet defensism is the thing. No, and also German defensism. He makes the case in there for when, if say, for example, the British or the French were going to invade Germany. If it, yeah, if it point, was like a war on German soil, then yes, because like the point is the German people have a right to defend themselves. Exactly. But the that, point is, is that in inter-imperialist wars. Like it no longer becomes a war that can be understood in terms of like defense of a, of a people against another because it becomes a war of inter-imperialist competition. Derek, pivot. It's time to pivot. We've gone through the questions. You know, there are some key figures that are going to come up over and over again. Maltov and Kalski are going to come up. Lenin's obviously going to come up. But I, I really think we should look at the first chapter, the first paragraph of Marxism as a political strategy, chapter one, because I think it it's, it's something we really have to take in to the point of why we're even discussing this. The essence of a revolutionary strategy is its long-term character. It is a frame within which we think about how to achieve our goals over the course of a series of activities and struggles, each of which has its own tactics, many of which we would never, I mean, it, it, he doesn't say this and I'm adding this, but it's definitely implied. Many of us, we will never live to see. So, you know, we have to think about this in terms of, not just what we're building, but like what we're building towards beyond, you know, the formation of whatever immediate sect or whatever we're talking about. And that's, I think that's why this first chapter focuses so much on the first international, because in a very real sense, none of the people who set that up, well, not none, but few of the people who set that up saw any of its fruits. Like they set up stuff that would happen later. And you have to yeah. think about it in those terms. I'd also say that like the situation of the first international is more similar to the one we have today, where the socialist movement is more of a petty bourgeois intelligentsia thing, 
and the labor movement is more and is 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 more separate from socialism if that makes sense that there's more of a separation between socialism and the labor movement and we are in even if we are seeing a renaissance in the labor movement we are still like you know we're just, the labor movement isn't exactly booming mike mcnair makes that point himself later on he basically says that like people want to talk about what you know 1917 all the time but in reality, our current situation is more similar to that of the first international because, you know, the labor movement is at a weaker is at a weak point, as Donald pointed out. But also, capitalism is much more global, you know, with what's generally called neoliberalism, and that's much more similar to how capitalism worked uh, or how capitalism functioned in the time of the first international. And not only yeah, that, yeah. the labor force is more atomized as well. You can argue that what people call neoliberalism is just basically a return to the kind of free trade capitalism that was dominant at, in like the 1870s, basically, but more modernized, obviously. But basically, like the capitalism of today has more in common with the capitalism of Marx's time than the capitalism of like 1945, 1975. I feel like the emphasis on on revolutionary strategy being long term in its character is kind of important because like many revolutionary groups think of revolution as a concept being almost like a spontaneous sort of thing where you know they just sort of organize their like small little vanguard or whatever and they're going to be able to hop on to the revolutionary situation where the working class is just going engaging in real class struggle and they're going to be able to hop on to that and steer it forward with their well-disciplined cadre. What is being presented in Mike McNear's revolutionary strategy is something that you have to build the party in a long, like set it up for the long term. You have to build up a base slowly through like things like developing Marxist unity and developing like the, both the S and the M of the merger formula over a long period of time and uniting it into the into the mass party and having that mass party like build up a base that's like able to really meaningfully carry out a revolution when you compare it to the sort of like quick and easy vanguardism of other supposedly leninist organizations it it stands out in great contrast so basically what we're saying is we will all be dead by the time any of our work comes to fruition. Are we all done with that? <laughs> well, like personally, so, I play in the lead the Red Army, so I'm just kidding. No, I yeah, think that's probably accurate. Are you, like, are I, you, I don't like I don't we, really we don't have a very long term horizon when it comes to like environmental politics. So um I, I agree with the broad conclusions of this book, but uh we gotta get it together. Oh yeah, I think we have probably like 20 years to make revolution before it's too late. But I mean that's still, like still that we have to think in the long term. We can't have this attitude. For example, the Spartacus League in Germany, they had this attitude that the revolution was coming, that Russia had started the revolution, and that, you know, these freshly like recruited militants just were just gonna sign up, you know, to fight on the barricades basically and destroy capitalism. And it was that simple. We just needed to like recruit the battalions and go into battle and the revolution was happening like imminently. And the German communists didn't have a long-term sense of building up a party that had hegemony in the working class, that actually had leadership in the working class around a revolutionary program. And so they just tried push after push and ended up just, you know, getting eventually taken over by the Nazis. And they didn't have a long-term strategy of building up a party and winning leadership over the labor movement. There is the, uh, the end to the introduction that briefly maybe shows his hand a little bit. The only person who would not want to make the generalization Leninist is probably a Leninist, right? Someone that wants to dispute the nominalist claim to Leninism. I feel like that he shows his hand a little bit here and that even though he has a fairly damning view of what actually occurred during the Russian Revolution, he more or less says that the only available options were red dictatorship and white dictatorship. The, the only thing that that makes me think, let's say that that is correct. 
it kind of opens the door to wondering if the February revolution was a mistake. <laughs> if, you know, it was just going to end in bloody dictatorship. Maybe they just should have kept the czar if there was no possibility of emancipation. I think one thing that's worth reading on this topic is Walter Rodney's book on the Russian Revolution. It's a book of essays that he wrote kind of on the importance of Bolshevism to the third world. And it kind of shows how in the long term, but the Russian Revolution really contributed to the world was more so decolonization than the first like real working socialism. And that the real long term historical political impact of the USSR is kind of this, you know, it was anti colonialism. Like, I just think that like, we have to admit that, yes, like the, the Russian Revolution ultimately didn't live up to its ideal of world socialism, but its impacts on world history were still overall progressive. And so I think that the October Revolution was justified, even considering how it ended up. Well, I, I was putting that forward because I actually don't think the February Revolution was a mistake. I think you have to bring into the question the possibility of human action causing mismanagement of a situation that could have been better. And I think what you see in 1918 is precisely that kind of thing. And I think it's a weirdly damning structuralist thing to do to leave that out. It kind of implicates revolution as being stupid when it, I think it could turn out better even in some desperate situations. I mean, I think like a lot of the like, excesses of the red terror and arbitrariness was it, it was just something that kind of exploded out of the working class. And it, it wasn't I don't really think that we can just blame like the, the, the violence and authoritarianism of the Russian Revolution on it, Lenin, per se, because it's almost out, like, like when the violence that I'm, I'm most concerned with here, but the inability to tolerate actual democracy. The Soviet Union up until 1921 was a relatively democratic nation. Bourgeois nations under similar situations of stress, they go through sort of a same situation in terms of like how they deal with civil liberties. I'm always wary when I hear a dichotomy like that, when I read that paragraph, because I often feel like there can be false dichotomies. Am I not right in saying that one of the options that they had at the time was going towards a social democrat kind of development? So to say that the idea was white terror or red terror is not a true dichotomy, that they, they, they discussed that choice, that it's not like there was only two choices. They couldn't have done that. The Mensheviks would have handed over power to the, to the cadets, who would have handed over power to the conservatives, who then would have handed over power to Kolchak. Basically, what happened was Lenin actually was open towards forming a coalition with the Mensheviks, but the Mensheviks said that they would only do it if they put Kerensky back in power and ended the rule of the Soviets. They also made the demand that Trotsky and Lenin leave their party, too, which is kind of absurd thing to demand, even. Completely reasonable thing to, to be afraid of, but the history is there, I think. The very last paragraph of this thing is also something I think that we should discuss. Donald, you read it. The use of hindsight is justifiable and necessary because the point of the whole exercise is to study the history for what it can tell us about where we are now, how we got there, and where we should try to go next. In this sense, it is loosely analogous to the sort of exercise that has to be undertaken if a bridge falls down. Why did the bridge fall down? If it was hit by a meteorite, we may well rebuild it in exactly the same form. But if the collapse was caused by problems that will predictably reoccur in the future, like severe storms and increased weight of traffic, we should redesign the bridge in light of the hindsight to meet these problems. In fact, that the problems which caused the collapse may not have been originally predictable effects for the moral responsible of the original designers, but it does not in the least alter our present tasks. That is actually one of my favorite paragraphs from this book because it kind of sums up how I look at trying to learn from history. Like, we're supposed to be, like, you know, materialists, right? So, like, you know, the physical sciences, a lot of times, they have a laboratory they can work in, right? But we don't have that. What we have is history. What I really like about this idea of this paragraph is how it's, it's trying to get this book and our analysis scientific. It's this idea of analyzing history and being analytical and studying what are the problems and studying how you would go and fix this. This thing of history, we can't set up experiments, but we can look at what happens. And for me, this is like 
a really succinct and good metaphor. You know, I think McNair shows a great ability to boil down complex ideas and analyses. And I just really like his style of writing. It, it, this is like McNair has been an engineer. And like, we need some engineering instead of like critical theory. The science thing, I, I totally agree with Tom that we need more science Marxists and then we need like, you know, Adorno wink nonsense. Like, just the fact that so many more Marxists like are in literary programs rather than science programs is just, it's, a, it's the opposite of what it used to be when there actually was like a workers movement led by Marxists. Like you actually had like Marxists who were in STEM and stuff. Like we need to wage a culture war for the sciences as uh, our friend uh, Cole the Dark Stars points out. I, I actually do like the, the hindsight justification. And I, I was going to say that I, I broadly agree with the characterization of the Civil War being made by Donald and Ian. There are other turning points, though, and and also the, the explanation that I've never found really satisfying, and I've even got it from Lars Lee, who's one of the reasons why I read this book, is that, well, as soon as the, the war stuff is going to stop, we can have the constituent assembly back, and yet we never ever get to that point even after the civil wars won you can turn necessity into a justification for pretty much anything but you have other things to compare it with you had the same you had the same justification made by the jacobins who then proceeded to you know lay the way for bonaparte and you have similar problems with the us but in the opposite direction because of the inability to do that with reconstruction I mean, here we're talking about the Civil War, which is, I guess, the U.S. model for the for a time period where you had a suspension of bourgeois liberty. So I, I do think we need to have the hindsight, and I completely agree there. But I also think we have to be careful about the motivatedness of painting everything as if it was the only outcome. As a side note, though, in some ways, this is all irrelevant now, except in the position, and if you're going to do this and look at this and try to come up with current strategies... What could you do early on to not get in that pincer that the Bolsheviks found themselves in in 1921? And that's, I guess that's the big question that you have to ask when you, when you think about this from a long-term strategic point is what are we building for so we don't always end up in that same cul-de-sac or, in the case of the German Revolution, not there in the first place. <laughs> It's weird that, like, McNair's talking about hindsight here, but just before he was drawing this false dichotomy, and I agree, like, that that paragraph is a false dichotomy. You know, there's a lot of ways that could have turned out. It could have become, you know, a social democracy. You could have had the workers' opposition take up steam. Uh, you could have just had the February Revolution. There's a lot of things that could have happened. The one thing I do disagree with, though, is that I don't. I hate the way that anarchists talk about the failures of the Bolshevik Revolution and make it out to be like Lenin and Trotsky are these like epitomes of moral evil. I don't think that's the right way to go about it. I think at the same time there were decisions made that did set the wheels in motion for what is to come later. And I also agree that like a lot, all the a lot of the other socialist parties, almost I, would, I guess as far as I know, all of them really we're going in reactionary directions, you know, from what you all were talking about with the Mensheviks to like the left SR is blowing shit up, you know? Uh, I think they deserve some of the blame as well, actually, because that's not the right way to go about things, in my opinion. But even if you were to ban all other socialist parties because these socialist parties keep acting in, in these reactionary ways, I don't think it was necessary to ban different factions within the party, nor was it necessary to tear down the Soviets. I don't think Lenin deserves the, the, the Red Scare kind of treatment that he gets, but I also think like he doesn't deserve to be held up as like the pillar of liberty, because he wasn't. And again, like, you know, Derek said something to the effect that like, you know, necessity can, can sometimes be used as, as an excuse. There was very tragic and very difficult and harsh conditions that they were under. I don't think anyone's debating that, but it seems like at a certain point, it just becomes a way to absolve some of the Bolshevik leaders for their mistakes, in my opinion. And I think that is where the nuance of hindsight needs to come in. It wasn't this, this false dichotomy between white terror and red terror. And it wasn't this idea that Lenin was a good boy, Lenin was a bad boy. Like, it's more nuanced than, than all of these dichotomies. 
I, I, I feel like I don't know if there's really anything that you can do per se to like prevent in a situation like that, letting like necessity become like a sort of snowball sort of like downward spiral into just straightforward dictatorship because like there are definitely situations where you end up with a position of power in a state of emergency just bourgeois democracies in general where these bourgeois democracies end up doing things that are kind of really really sketchy in a time of emergency for example with the united states during world war ii FDR government basically ordered the rounding up of Japanese into internment camps, took away their property, and essentially put them in these really crummy internment camps for the entirety of World War II. Obviously, this is kind of a major totalitarian violation of civil liberties under FDR during like this really long and extended period of emergency, like. Yet the United States didn't really end up being a sh- like a dictatorship in the end. I I don't know if that's like a testament to bourgeois democracy or something like that, but I feel like it's more of a matter of what people might call luck or like randomness in history. It's like you're making a really big bet with any kind of emergency situation where you you have to like clamp down on power and expand the powers of like an an executive branch and just make all these orders that some of them you're definitely going to regret doubly so for like a revolutionary government but yeah i don't feel like there's any way to like full proof it from like just turning into straightforward dictatorship honestly maybe it comes down to leadership i don't know I think we need to actually look at the example of what happens in the Russian Revolution where you do have this period of war communism, you know, there's requisitions from the peasants and then there's a red terror because of resistance that this policy promotes. But ultimately, the Bolsheviks are able to carry through. The economy is able to, even though there's negative growth and stuff, like it actually, you know, you, you if you read like, you know, the economic histories and stuff, you see that like, as you know 1917 the year 1917 you just the russian economy was being sabotaged by the bourgeoisie and being destroyed you basically had like such an utter disequilibrium as bukharin says that the policies of war communism of coercion basically war communism was necessary but then you had what was the new, new economic policy and you actually did see significant liberalization during that period You had a fairly pluralist educational culture. You had, you know, the Soviets actually did have some impact. Workplaces actually did have some level of uh, self-management. I think it was then when the Bolsheviks could have started moving in a more socialist direction. But what happened was Stalin eventually took power, you know, closed off the possibility of that happening. But I think that there is, you know, a a potential that after the Civil War, the Soviet Union could have gone in a more democratic direction. I think that uh, the ideas of Bukharin kind of signified that direction. But instead, the ideas of Stalin kind of won out. Yeah, I mean, I also obviously totally agree with, like, the science aspect that Tom and Donald was just talking about. And I think that's really what we're doing here. These, These conversations are connected. We're looking at what happened in the past to and trying to parse out like what really happened in, the, in as uh, empirical as a way as possible, and then use that to inform our our, our trajectory. And in that spirit, I, I do want to push push back a little bit against what Rosa was talking about. I think if in situations that are incredibly dire, are we just doomed to despotism? Are we just doomed to repeat the same thing as Stalin? Because to me, I don't, I don't think we, that necessarily is correct. I, I still think even, even under the very harsh conditions of the Russian Revolution, there were things that could have been done differently that weren't. There were decisions that were made that did set the stage for Stalinism. I, I, obviously, you know, under dire situations, it might not be 100% uh, egalitarian or liberatory or whatever. But I don't think you have to make as many sacrifices as were made. And I think really like that kind of is also a false dichotomy. Like if if you're under harsh conditions, then you have to get to despotism. It's not a sound argument, in my opinion, right? Like there are other decisions that can be made. So I feel like that kind of misses the point of this exercise 
uh, of you know examining history. And I do agree with Donald that you know sticking with the uh, NEP was a better strategy than forced collectivization. But I think in reality there were still decisions that were made. There were still anti-democratic decisions that were made by Bolshevik party leadership that led to Stalinism. And it's true that Lenin hated the direction it was going towards the end of his life, but he is partly to blame, you know, and not just him, but the decisions that were made by the Bolshevik party and as a whole that were anti-democratic allowed this to happen. And I don't think we can just ignore that. I mean, I think McNair might just ultimately be a bit inconsistent on this score. It blows me away that McNair is apparently some sort of Leninist. I can see it through the way Donald sees this. But even for like a crypto analytical Marxist, that I always say that, right? But again, he, he does write in this way. He sort of bears a stamp of a sort of Trotskyist ap- apologism. And it's not like unthought out, you know, but... Later in the book, he makes historical comparisons that I think should lead to the conclusion, or at least led me to the conclusion, that there are options in history. Leadership matters, as as Rosa started to get at. Lincoln did suspend democratic freedoms during the Civil War, but he bent over backwards to keep democratic norms within friendly territory, you might say. Washington, during the Revolution... Um, had to deal with grain requisition problem and chose not to do them and to endure the hunger because the morale crushing would have been worse from requisitions. Uh, McNair makes these comparisons himself. So I, I have trouble understanding how he could regurgitate something like this when I take that evidence and that is, you know, this made me not a Leninist, essentially. When I was approaching it, I was. And then when I really thought this through, I was no longer. Ultimately, the cash value for a lot of this to me is that, you know, we can all have a relativist part of us because Marxism has that historical materialist theory. And yes, there are things that need to be achieved in history, et cetera. But for our project today to look towards social democracy or Leninism, like we have to do it very, very, very critically. I even feel like that's understating it. You know, we need to like, not do this again. (laughs) Like, we need to do something else. And I really don't like the attitude that, you know, there's nothing to be gained from looking at the 20th century. Our historic break makes it that that all this is completely useless and garbage. We don't need to look at it. But there is something worthwhile in attitude from there. And I think the analytical Marxist point of view enables us to go back into history with a knife and not, you know, searching for our Sorelian daddy. The sense that we're sort of doomed to despotism, and just referring to a point that McNair made in a lecture once, he pointed out that there's a weird tendency when new social forms emerge where it is going to be intensely despotic. The example he gives is the emergence of the Florentine Republic during the 15th century, which then turns into a sort of, they've, I mean, they had a secret police and all that kind of stuff. And then after it falls, very much like the fall of the Soviet Union, is followed by a hundred years of kind of monarchical triumphalism. And so like I, I could definitely imagine a very similar thing kind of emerging, you know, after a hundred years of socialism kind of being in the cold, just as I suppose capitalist democracy spent a hundred years in the cold. It could very well be the case that we do see like a kind of reemergence. And I would also point out the problem with the the, the thing about leadership. This is just something I've I've noticed in a sort of observation I've noticed about parties and not just parties, but probably also like large conglomerations of parties, which, you know, things like the second and third international, especially, which is that with these huge, massive organizations, the sort of best rises to the top. There seems to be a very real tendency among those sorts of things to create extremely adept leaders and thinkers and writers uh, that we just don't really see today. Which tells me, I think, while leadership might matter, I think structure still matters more. And you don't really have leadership emerge without like a structure that sort of uh, fosters those sorts of things. I mean, America is actually a pretty decent example when you bring up uh, Abraham Lincoln. Well, you wouldn't have Abraham Lincoln if you didn't have actually a 
a pretty flourishing capitalist democracy that would allow a sort of kid from Kentucky, was it Kentucky or was it Tennessee, to emerge. One of the things about when we, we talk about uh, these strategic things, you have to be really thinking about how to set these norms up. One of the problems that, that I have had trying to implement this things from this book and organizations in my life is that a lot of times the structures of the organizations that you are assimilating into the <laughs> party aren't copacetic to doing any of this and also are like democratic for like the first 50 people who started the group, but not beyond that because they set up everything and made it fairly unquestionable. And so as, as a thing to kind of end off on, and, and, and I think in something to be thinking about as we talk about this in the future, maybe wrapping all this up together, how are we going to be applying this when we set up our structure for the orgs and stuff that we want to see and hopefully eventually a party? Because right now in the structure of American democracy, I actually really do have a hard time imagining an actual socialist party coming into being that doesn't end up with sectarian tendencies that would that'll flatten it out before it ever gets started. I don't want to feel that way, but I do. That's my crucial question is is you know Ian's got a valid point about these structures and that's really vital. That's a big deal. Ultimately, what we want is maximum freedom for the proletariat and for socialists and then we want to make totalitarian inroads on capital only. And the only reason you resort to this kind of stuff, which might look more like terrifying soft power than any sort of direct terror, is uh, that distinction is very important. I hate to echo Carl Schmitt because his work leaves no room for a humanist horizon where we can get beyond any kind of antagonism. But it is good to treat friends like friends and not like enemies. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. <laughs>